Well, it's time for us to begin this evening. If you'll uh, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 10, we will uh, begin our study. We looked uh, last time at the sixth angel sounded the sixth trumpet, and we saw another one of these descriptions of the judgment that is coming upon the wicked nation that is persecuting God's people. And we noted the, um, the details, the, uh, the great army that had been unleashed, that had been prepared by God for this. And we noted at the end of the uh, description that in verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. In verse 21, and they did not repent of their murders or of their sorceries. And so far God has been describing what he is going to do to get the attention of these people. And remember, our approach has been not that these are a sequence of events, but that this is the same judgment that God has been describing over and over again. And God is doing for them what he typically does with any wicked nation. He gives them an opportunity to repent, an opportunity to hear the truth and to change their ways. But we have heard now that this is not going to work, for these people are not going to repent. And so we might expect now that uh, things are going to change, and that is exactly what happens. Before we hear the seventh trumpet sound at the end of chapter 11, though, we have, therefore, another interlude scene. And so we're getting kind of used to seeing these interludes. Uh, this one has some Old Testament roots in a couple of places. Uh, Daniel chapter 12 describes a coming persecution for God's people from Daniel's time. And in Daniel chapter 12, uh, Daniel is told to seal up the vision for it is for many days hence. It was not for Daniel's time, and therefore it was not to be um, uh, unsealed for him. And then a, a similar scene in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 2 and 3, where the prophet is given a scroll. And in one of the more strange scenes of the Old Testament, he is told to eat the scroll, and it makes his stomach bitter. And the scroll represents the judgments that God is going to bring against the wicked. And the reason it makes the prophet's uh, stomach bitter is because it is difficult and harsh statements. They are the kinds of things that are not pleasant to talk about. And uh, therefore, he is given that responsibility. Well, we're going to see these kinds of things make their appearance in Revelation chapter 10 this evening as John in, uh, encounters a, s a similar experience. So in verse 1, uh, we hear that I saw another angel, a strong angel, coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud. And the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Uh, immediately, we might be struck with the fact that this angel, in his description, sounds a lot like the description that we have heard of Christ back in chapter 1. There is this reference to uh, pillars of fire and uh, the, the cloud and so forth. And so that seems to be intentional on John's part to make us understand that this is some kind of divinely appointed messenger. Uh, as a matter of fact, he is described so much like the Lord that some uh, students of the book of Revelation have suggested that this is Jesus. Uh, I would suggest to you, however, that he is not. Because the Bible consistently refrains from portraying Christ as an angel. And especially if you read passages like Hebrews chapter 1, where the author makes it very clear that Jesus is greater than the angels. He has a status and a name that is greater than any angel. And so even though this angel has these kinds of characteristics, uh, we must, I think, refrain from identifying him with Jesus. So if he's not the Lord, who is he? Well, I think you could probably make a case that John might have in mind the character that is known in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. If you'll recall in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Exodus, as God sends his angel to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and through the wilderness, that there are some cases where it says that the angel said to Israel, and then in the very next breath, the text says that the Lord said. Uh, what this angel uh, is exactly, it's, it's hard to say, but he is apparently a representative of the presence of God. 
that has the authority to speak the words of God. And so when he speaks, it is the words of God that he speaks. And we have that same kind of thing, it seems here, that his appearance is certainly designed to make us think that he is uh, closely related to the divine and uh, uh, perhaps even uh, related uh, in some way with that authority. Uh, and maybe, as we noted here on the chart, uh, perhaps in contrast to the evil angels that we've seen in chapter 9, that the Lord has been unleashing to do their bidding, now we have this divinely sent messenger uh, in contrast. Uh, we want to mention here the fact that he is clothed with a cloud uh, suggests to us the image of God in the wilderness leading Israel. Uh, Numbers 14.14 14, they have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. You are seen eye to eye while your cloud stands over them. You go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. We're told that this angel's feet are like pillars of fire. And so we have a lot of this wilderness imagery here, again, suggesting this identification with the angel of the Lord and therefore is probably a symbol of God's protection of his people in a hostile world, just like he had his angel traveling with the Israelites in the wilderness. Uh, then we come to verse 2, this little book, that he has in his hand a little book which was open. And the identity of this little book has been debated among students of the uh, book of Revelation. Uh, it seems to me that you could make a case that it is the same scroll that we saw in chapter 5. Remember, that uh, as God was being presented in his glory there, that there was a book that appeared, but it was sealed with seven seals. And the question was raised, who is worthy to open the book? And the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, was found to be worthy. And through his agency, then the seals began to be opened. Well, you'll notice that this one is open. And so it would seem to, to be the same book that we have here the uh, judgments of God represented again by this scroll, and they are being unleashed as we speak, as it were, uh, as John sees this. Uh, we are told furthermore about this angel in verse 2, that he placed his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Now that might just sound like, you know, hyperbole to us, maybe a little uh, imaginative uh, exaggeration to give us this big picture. But as we have looked at with many other things in the book, I want to suggest to you that to somebody living in Asia Minor, where this book was addressed in the first century, that that would not have been some an unimportant little detail. That a person in Asia Minor would have recognized that this is a reference to the power of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire claimed to be the Lord and the master of both the land and the sea. And as well as the fact that this is an Old Testament expression for the world. And so we have both of them kind of combined the Old Testament imagery being used to depict uh, what is normally the domain of Rome. And to give you a sense of just how deep this was, this is a statue that stood in the public forum in the ancient city of Smyrna. Right outside there in the, uh, the forum, the big kind of town square area was this statue. There is Artemis, the part that is damaged. In the middle is Poseidon, the god of the sea, and immediately next to him is Demeter, the goddess of the earth and its fertility. Why did the ancients put those gods together? Well, it wasn't by accident, because in Roman times, these were the gods that represented Roman power, and the land and the sea represents all of Rome's dominion. I think I've shown you this before, but this is an inscription from the city of Pergamum, one of the cities of the book of Revelation, and it refers in the underlined part here to the emperor Trajan as being the lord of earth or land and sea. And so when we see here in chapter 10 and verse 2 that this angel placed his foot on the sea and on the land, uh, that's not accidental. We have here a challenge to the might of Rome, that this domain that Rome claimed was its territory, God is saying, no, it's mine. 
and he sends his messenger and stands on the earth and on the land claiming the world as his kingdom, not as Caesar's. Well, in verse 3, uh, he cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. That again makes us uh, think about what we've heard before, chapter 5, the lion of Judah came forth with the authority to unleash judgment against this wicked people. And so even though we have suggested that this angel is not an image of Jesus Christ, he certainly speaks with that kind of divine authority, and the imagery makes us recall that. But also it says that uh, when he cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And thunder is often associated with the presence of God as well. Remember in Exodus 19, when God brought Israel to Mount Sinai before he delivered the Ten Commandments to them, that the mountain was full of lightning and fire and thunder. In Psalm 29, the first nine verses, there speak of the power and glory of God. And the voice of the Lord is in the poetry there, paralleled with the thunders, and that is mentioned seven times in that psalm there. And so John is again tapping into an Old Testament image that recalls the authority and God's ability to speak the punishments against the nations, and here uh, applies it to this symbol. Uh, the question is exactly what does this represent? And some people have suggested that the seven thunders are the message that he speaks, or some have suggested that the seven thunders simply precede the message. Uh, and you can believe what you will about that. I don't uh, particularly have an opinion about that, I guess. Um, whether it is the message we're about to hear or just simply kind of an introduction like it was at Mount Sinai doesn't seem to make a whole lot of difference. The point is his divine authority. Uh, the interesting part, though, is verse 4. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. So John is doing what he normally does throughout the book. He sees and he writes and he hears and he writes. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken and do not write them. Now that's kind of unusual because this is supposed to be the book of Revelation where what John saw gets communicated to us so that we know what he knows. And here the message is, don't tell anybody. Don't write it down. So why not write it down? Well, remember, we saw, and we mentioned a moment ago, a similar scene in the book of Daniel, where Daniel is given a vision about a persecution that was to come. And he was told to seal up the vision because it was for many days hence. And, though, and so that, therefore seems to be that kind of connotation, first of all, that this is not something that is uh, pertaining to the situation John is looking at, that there is something kind of uh, uh, out of kilter here. Uh, but why is he told not to write? Uh, some have suggested that uh, it's because there is something here that God did not want communicated to the churches in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and in verse 4. Let's go and read that because I can't remember it off the top of my head. It says, uh, Paul says, I was caught into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. And so some have suggested that maybe this is one of those mysterious visions and communications that is so marvelous that maybe John is just told, no, you can't repeat this. It's, it's so great that human ears can't hear it. That's one possibility. Uh, others have suggested that, that God is withholding information because he doesn't tell us everything that he does. God is not obligated to tell us everything. He only needs to tell us enough to assuage our fears and to uh, prompt us to faith. And so it may be that some have suggested uh, John is told they don't need to know this, that I've told them enough and uh, I'm not going to tell them everything. I'm not crazy about that explanation myself, but uh, you may think that's the one. Uh, some have suggested, based on Daniel chapter 12, that the reason John can't write it down is because it's not time for these things to happen. 
Because if John writes it down, then it is going to happen. It becomes revealed and therefore active, and that the Lord is saying, this is not for this time. And so maybe its fulfillment is not for John's day. Others have suggested that uh, maybe that God doesn't want him to write this down because God is not going to tell us how he is going to deal with this enemy. Uh, it seems to me, though, that there is maybe a better explanation than all of these. And if we take our clue from the last part of chapter 9, we've seen this series of judgment. There was a series of seven seals and then seven trumpets, and all announcing that God is going to unleash his fury against this nation. And he has started off by not destroying that nation completely, but trying to get its attention, to chastise it, to get it to repent. But we've been told that they're not going to repent. And so it would seem to me that a good explanation of why John is told not to write is that this was yet another series of judgments that was designed to get people to repent. And God says, no, we're not going to do that anymore because this isn't working. I'm not going to keep chastising them and them not listen to me. And so John is aware that God could do more, but the message is God's not going to do any more. That the time for patience is over and the only thing left is going to be there for destruction. So it seems to me that uh, the point is that since the nation will not repent, further chastisements for that purpose won't come and all that remains is the destruction. And I think that's what we're going to see uh, here in chapters 10 and 11 as we get to the end of the first half of this book. All right then. Then the angel, verse 5, whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land, lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. So this angel now takes an oath. And he swears on two things, on God's eternity and on God's nature as creator. Does somebody have Daniel 12, verse 7 handy and can read that passage for us just to kind of uh, hear the echo of that passage in this text here? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times and half a time, and that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things will be finished. All right, so there we have assurance from that messenger of what is going to happen. Same kind of thing going on here. And what he swears by is interesting. First of all, on God's eternity, he swore on him who lives forever and ever, on the God who can be counted on because he's always there. And secondly, on the fact that God is the creator of everything in the heavens, the earth, and in the sea that he is its sovereign Lord, he has control over his creation, and there is no way, therefore, that he can fail to do uh, what is going to be said here. And so the oath is that there will be delay no longer. Now remember that who this book is written to. Christians who are facing persecution. Persecution seems to just be in its beginning. And John is writing to tell them that it's going to get worse before it gets better. You're going to have to go through a great tribulation like we saw back in chapter 7. Now, God's going to take care of you. He has sealed his people on their foreheads, but they have to go through this great tribulation and be faithful, as he told the letters uh, to the churches in chapters 2 and 3. And you read these judgments that we have looked at, and imagine yourself one of these people entering into persecution, and so far the message is, well, God hasn't destroyed them yet, and God's going to give them another chance. And after a while you think, just exactly what you saw in chapter 5, how long are you going to let these wicked people go on, Lord, without punishing them? How long are you just going to keep giving them a chance? And finally the word comes, there will be delay no longer. God has given them their chance. You patiently wait through it, and then God is going to destroy them. This would have been good news to these people. 
that God is not just going to string these people along and string you along forever, that his patience will be exhausted and he will destroy the people that are hurting you. And so this is actually good news, and the fact that it is done with an oath uh, is good news as well, because it will not fail. Verse 7, therefore, uh, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Now, of course, we would want to know, and the Christians of Asia Minor would want to know, okay, God, when? How long do we have to endure your trying to get them to repent? When are you finally going to destroy the enemy? And the answer is, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel that we haven't heard yet, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished. The mystery of God uh, is simply that which God has kept secret. And it is mentioned in a couple different places, uh, Mark chapter 4 and verse 11, as Jesus is preaching in parables, Remember, they asked him, why do you teach the multitudes in parables? And Jesus said to his disciples, to you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul talks about the revelation of the mystery and the summing up of all things in Christ Jesus, how God has unfolded his plan through Jesus Christ and delivered us uh, into this great kingdom. The mystery ultimately involves the kingdom of God and God's reign over all things. So what is so mysterious about it? Well, it seems to me that if you look in this context, it's not hard to figure out what the mystery was. The mystery is, how can the suffering of God's people be compatible with God's control over everything? If God really is in control, then why do his people have to suffer? Why do wicked nations like Rome get to prosper and beat up on God's people if God really is reigning? That's the mystery. It doesn't seem to make sense. But the message here is that Oh, it's going to make sense that the mystery of God, this apparent incompatibility, is going to be finished. That God is going to resolve this tension. He is going to resolve what seems to be a contradiction, and he's going to make it clear by the end of this that he really is in control. And this is going to happen, as it says there in verse 7, in the days of the voice of of the seventh angel, which is not until the end of chapter 11. In other words, what John is simply told is it's not going to be now. God is going to resolve this, but not now. You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to endure and be faithful, but understand by the oath of the angel that God is going to destroy this nation. So when the Roman Empire had been judged in God's reign through Christ is thereby proven, or some have suggested that it's the final judgment at the end of time that, that is in view here, I don't think it's necessarily that, but the message is that it's going to happen, not now, but eventually. And this is the very thing that says in verse 7 that he preached to his servants the prophets. And there's a lot in the Old Testament about how God would establish a kingdom that would reign over all his enemies. Genesis 49.10, the ruler's staff will not depart from Judah. Psalm 2, uh, God raising up his Messiah to rule over the nations and shatter them like pottery with an iron rod. Psalm 110, God says to the Messiah, sit at my right hand till I've made your enemies the footstool of your feet. Isaiah 9, uh, the uh, Messiah there is given a kingdom that has no end. Daniel 2, 44, the kingdom that appears at the end of that vision is a kingdom that will never be replaced. Over and over again, we have these pictures in the Old Testament that God promised that I am going to rule the world. And I'm going to make it clear that I'm in control. 
And what better display of God's power than to take on the mightiest nation in the world at that time, the Roman Empire. And so now we begin to understand how maybe God's mystery is going to be accomplished. It's going to be accomplished through the faithful suffering of his people, just as it was with Jesus. This is the thing that people couldn't understand about the story of Jesus, right? The Jews found this to be a stumbling block. How can a crucified Messiah be the answer to our problems? We were expecting a Messiah to come and kill the enemy, not get killed by the enemy. And here are these Christians in the very same kind of condition. How can this be the kingdom of God if the enemy has the upper hand over us? Well, God has set it up this way. Jesus' endurance of his suffering led to his victory and his reign over his enemies, and the message is that it's going to be that way with his kingdom as well. That God's going to destroy that wicked nation, and in the end, the only thing left standing is going to be the kingdom of God. And then you will know beyond all doubt that God is the absolute ruler of the universe and that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of all other lords. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, we hear Peter saying, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's the message that we have here in Revelation 10. And then it will be perfectly clear what God was doing. Uh, this is actually typical of prophecy, where God is telling his people, listen, it's going to be okay. I'm going to take care of it. Hang in there. You should know that you're going to suffer, but that doesn't mean that things have gone wrong. It only showcases the great power of God, and you will see in the end. So what we're looking at is that God has warned the wicked to repent, but they haven't been listening. The wicked are unjustly persecuting the people of God, wondering when is God finally going to fix this. The message is that God will destroy the wicked. There will be delay no longer. God's going to destroy them. But just as we saw before in chapter 7, God does not destroy the righteous with the wicked. And he is going to make it very clear now that I'm going to protect my people. Just like we saw back in chapter 7, the people that were sealed on their foreheads so that they would not be hurt in the great tribulation. Same kind of scene is now coming here in chapter 11, verses 1 through 6 in different words. So, having been given that assurance, verse 8, the voice I heard from heaven I again heard speaking with me and saying, Go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little book, and he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and in my mouth it was as sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. We have a similar scene in the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is given such a message and told to do the very same kind of thing with it. And remember the circumstances of Ezekiel there in Babylonian captivity, living in a world where the enemy had gained the upper hand. And Ezekiel is told, well, I've got a message for you. I want you to tell the people of Babylon that their day is coming. And, of course, those people wouldn't listen. They were impenitent. They were idolaters, just like Rome in the first century. And so the message is delivered, and just as it was then, so is it here. The book is the message of the destruction of this wicked nation. And if, in case there's any doubt, verse 11 makes it clear that this prophecy is going to be about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings, which is exactly the phrase that is used in chapter 17 of the Roman Empire. And so, oh, John, there's more to preach, but it's not this partial judgment. What you're going to be preaching now is the destruction of this great kingdom 
which would be a sweet thing to the people of God. Uh, good news that God is going to destroy them, so sweet in his mouth like honey, and yet it is a horribly bitter message, uh, a message of doom and destruction uh, that would make you sick uh, to think about it as it were. All right, then, let's uh, look at the first few verses of chapter 11. The die is cast. The judgment is coming. There was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Measuring the temple is something that happens a time or two in Old Testament uh, imagery. In Ezekiel chapter 40, you may recall in Ezekiel's visions there that he has a vision of the Messianic age, and that Messianic age is described like a temple, the perfect temple of God, from which flows the water of life in the midst of it. Uh, it is measured. And in Zechariah chapter 2, before the great destruction that happens in Zechariah's book, we have a measuring of the temple as well. Uh, measuring the temple is a symbol of protection. You measure it in order to know where the wall is going to go, to see the limits of the zone around it, as it were. And so to measure something means to mark out the boundaries of it. And that's what John is being told to do here, that he has a rod and he is going to mark out the boundaries of safety and certain people will be in and certain people will be out. And of course, in the New Testament, temple is very often a symbol for the church. Paul talks in 1 Corinthians 13 about the Corinthian church being the temple of God. In Ephesians 2, you are growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Uh, same kind of image here, that this is the people of God represented as a temple. And of course, uh, Temples were common in the ancient world. We don't have them in our culture, but probably the first temple that John would think about would be the Jerusalem temple. And you may recall that it has several features. It has the outer wall that surrounds the court of the Gentiles, then there is a court of women, and then a court of priests out here in front. Uh, and what John is being told basically is to measure off this part here, this inner wall, but do not measure off the court which is outside. Now, the vision that John is looking at is not based precisely on the Jerusalem temple, because the Jerusalem temple has three courts, not just two, but the idea is certainly there, that there is a safe zone, an inner zone, and then a courtyard outside that is made for the Gentiles. The meaning here is just exactly what we saw back in chapter 7, that before God unleashes this violent wrath against this enemy, he's going to make sure that his people are okay. And even though they are in the midst of unbelievers who persecute it, God's going to be with them. And we're going to see one of the most striking symbols of that here in chapter 11. Before we get to that, though, uh, in verse 2, this outer court has been given to the nations. And that's never a good thing in the Old Testament. To be given to the nations means to be given to destruction. Uh, the nations are hostile against the people of God. And so outside of this zone, there are the wicked, the, those that are uh, blasphemous and idolaters and so forth. And they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. Now this is one of those places where we have to make sure we're, we're reading the book correctly. Uh, 42 months is the same as 1,260 days, which is mentioned in verse 3. It is the same time span as three and a half years which is the very kind of time that is mentioned in Daniel 7 and again in Daniel 12 that is called time times, that is one time, two more times 
and then half a time, or three and a half, which is half of the divine number of seven, and three and a half consistently in the Bible is a symbol of persecution. And so this court of the Gentiles has been given to them, and they will tread underfoot the holy city. There will be a time of persecution. Now, if you go looking through ancient history and saying, where was there a three and a half year period of persecution, you've missed the point. This is not a calendar of ancient history. There's not a literal three and a half years that is in mind here. It's a symbol. And what God is simply saying is, there's going to be a time of persecution. I'm not going to stop it. You're going to have to go through it. But God is going to protect you while you're going through it. This time of persecution could be 10 years. It could be 100 years. You know, it, it's nothing literal here. It's just simply a short, antithetical time, ki kind of time that they've got to go through uh, in the plan of God. So the temple of God, or the holy city, is going to be persecuted for a time. And in verse 3, I will grant authority to my two witnesses, which seems to me is another image now of the church. The church described in prophetic terms as they preach to a wicked world. They're going to be holding forth the light of God in the midst of a world that won't listen, and they're going to have to endure the hostility of the world as they do this. Why are there two of them? Probably because of Deuteronomy 19.15, uh, where God makes it very clear that no one shall be condemned on the basis of one witness only, but on the basis of two or more witnesses, every word shall be established. And so when you've got two witnesses, you have truth established. And I think we have two witnesses here because it is a symbol of the truthful message that they speak. Uh, and then we are told right after that, these two witnesses prophesy for the exact amount of time that the persecution is going to go on, 1260 days, and they're going to be clothed in sackcloth. We'll come to that in just a moment. These also, verse 4, are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So it's as if John has a bunch of symbols he wants us to see at once. There's the temple, the holy dwelling place of God, which is also described as two witnesses, which is also described as two olive trees. If you've ever read Zechariah chapter 4, Zechariah has a vision of a lampstand that is being continuously fed with oil by two olive trees. And in that image, it is a, uh, an image of God supplying his people with what they need in order to survive. It is a reference of God giving his spirit and his life and his light to his people as they uh, stand in a wicked world. And so that's what John is depicting here, that the people of God are this image of faithfulness, of, uh, of nourishment, lampstands that stand before the Lord, shining his light to the world in a time when persecution is going out. Uh, the 1260 days, as we noted, is the very same time of persecution. So while the persecution is going on, what is the church doing? Is it hiding? Is it running off to the caves? No, they're testifying because the church is like two witnesses that even though the world hates them, they preach the message faithfully. Like the two olive trees and the two lampstands, they stand and they deliver what they are supposed to do. And so it is a picture of faithfulness of God's people. And we are told that they do so with sackcloth, which is, of course, the clothing of mourning in a time of hardship, because it is a message of doom and destruction, 
And interestingly enough, for at least part of his prophetic career, Isaiah prophesied in sackcloth as well about the destruction of Jerusalem. We've already noted this thing about Zechariah 4. The task is testifying. God's prophetic word is like a light. We hear that image uh, in the Bible in several places. John 5, 2 Peter 1. We have the prophetic word like a light shining in a dark place. And so that is the image here as well. God's people standing, testifying, even though they are being persecuted, the light does not go out, the olive oil does not dry up, uh, God protects them. We're going to see, however, that this takes an interesting turn in a moment. Uh, it's not protection from all harm, but it is ultimate protection. If anyone wants to harm these two witnesses, we're told in verse 5, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies, so if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. This is obviously a throwback to the Elijah story in 2 Kings chapter 1, where the king sends people to arrest Elijah. And Elijah says, if I'm a prophet of God, may fire come down and kill you, and it happens. And the king sends another bunch of men, and it happens to them again. What's the point? Just like it was with Elijah, the wicked aren't going to hurt these people. And notice again that fire comes out of their mouth. We noted in, in, the old, in the imagery that mouth has to do with testimony. Sometimes true testimony, sometimes false, but here it is, the witnesses of God. And how are they going to win? By the testimony of the gospel, by preaching the truth, they will overcome. 1 Samuel 4, 7 through 8, the Philistines were afraid. They said, God has come into the camp. Woe to us, nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who shall deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who smote the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. You hear that same kind of thing in verse 6. They have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall like Elijah's time. They have the power over the water to turn them to blood like in the Exodus, to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. The effect is going to be the same on this wicked world. Here again we have the waters and the earth. They can shut up the sky. They have the power over the waters and to strike the earth. This is God's domain, not Rome not Rome's, and God has control over it, and it shows the powerlessness of the false gods and those who worship them, and shows that true power lies with God's people, not with the enemy. And this power lies in the gospel and its warning of judgment, and it is a power that enables them to overcome their enemies. Now, we're going to see that it's not all a bowl of cherries here because starting in verse 7 next time there is persecution this is real persecution but there's nothing that the enemy can do ultimately to these people that's the message all right we will pick up next time at verse 7 thanks again for your good attention